So I decided to quit my, my full-time time job. I had a contract with no ending and uh, everybody wanted me to stay there uh, in the institution and I decided no, I'm not learning a lot more so I, I decided to, to move on. Now I'm in another institution. I'm a European project manager. I, we coordinate a, a project in a mental health policy with 30 partners from 27 European countries and we are the team that is coordinating all this. So, I still have two minutes. So this is my, my path and what I wanted to tell you is that Okay, uh, yes, there are uh, a lot of jobs in Portugal that are about knowledge brokering, which is what I identify myself with, which is promoting collaboration between academia, between research and industry, policy makers, decision makers, uh, users, uh, consumers, etc. And even though I've been working in academia all this time, uh, I'm not sure. I've been working as a researcher, as a professor, as a communicator, as a manager. I'm not sure if I'm uh, inside the academia because, and this is my, uh, my message to you, if you consider after your PhD to do such kind of jobs in academia, uh, although I, my vision, and I believe all the vision of people in this room, is that uh, universities definitely need people to uh, liaise, to broker the knowledge to, other, uh, to the other sectors, to the industry, etc. They are still at a loss to understand how they can incorporate people to do this professionally. So in academia, either you are a professor, or you are an administrative staff. Either you know everything and you are in the lead of everything or you're just doing daily tasks. And there is this emergent class of professionals that are needed for the university but are somehow being a pioneers opening how they can work inside. So lucky enough, I, I like to be uh, this kind of pioneer. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thank you so much. Before going to the audience, I'm going to make a brief summary. So I remind the topic of this forum, it's about education, employing, employment and entrepreneurship. So we, we've just seen the, the histories and, uh, of, uh, three, of three guests. Um, I'd like to bring here also uh, something Mourinho said in his interview, uh, I think one or two weeks ago. He said, I'm happy. And recall of some of you said about following your passion. So you have really to be passionate about what you're thinking about, what you're doing. When you think about the PhD, uh, uh, you should think about uh, big in-depth knowledge, about thinking different, about doing things in the systematic way, being summarizing basically what you said, about thinking about skills, what kind of skills you you need, you'll get out of your PhD, and uh, how relevant are they are, are them for your career, and and of course uh, follow as you've seen in this in, in Marta's case, and also in Francisco follow, you know what you really enjoy doing. So um, one question I'd like to make to the three three um, speakers is, how do you see? Education at the entrepreneurship level changing or evol evolving in the future uh, so that some other skills may be uh, um, um, acquired by the PhD students in the sense that they can more efficiently follow their passion either in industry or academia. For academia it's more or less clear, you know, you're, you're going to do research. Um, but if you want to follow the path for industry, are there some skills missing that you should think about? And so I'd like to go around, um, please. Very fast okay. reply. I think, uh, um, first, I, I like to talk about capabilities, still skills, you know? What are the capabilities that you are willing? 
and uh, there are one that is uh, first one. The first one is the communication. Okay, that for me this is the first one. How you communicate the science that you are creating? How you how you engage others on the things that you are doing? Okay, um, and the second one uh, has relation with the. Uh, and it's related with the communication, and is how you transfer your knowledge in economical value. This is uh, the two things that uh, I, I think is very relevant to transmit and to create these capabilities in the people that we have now in the PhD and in the entrepreneur area. Okay. Um, the ideas I have one one of my colleagues said always that the ideas the value of the ideas is zero. The idea, the value, is zero. If you are not able to create a project that makes the idea in money. Okay? Or the idea that impacts something. Because the money could be zero if you are talking about the social environment. Okay? But you are doing an impact. The idea itself doesn't have any value. If you are not able to put the idea in a real project in the world, in the economic side or in the social side. Thank you. Um, so I think the entrepreneurial route is, is certainly uh, very relevant and increasingly relevant. I, I mean, in the area that I mean, we have uh, a growing body of research that, that tells us um, how important uh, uh, new firms are for, uh, for economic growth and for uh, job creation. And so, in, especially in a country like, uh, like Portugal, where, where we have most firms have a very low level of, of investment in, in R&D, and so are they themselves um, not the origins of, of new technologies and new ideas. The work that's coming out of academia is certainly uh, a very important source of entrepreneurial projects and entrepreneurial ideas. Now, the training um, on what you need to do in terms of the managerial skill sets um, that you need to do to get a project to market, as you were saying, because that's what, what, uh, what, um, what defines its value, are extremely important. And most people that go through engineering or science careers have never been trained in that, um, in that space. I mean, at, at, at Catholica Lisbon, we have a partnership with the Banco Espírito Santo um, that's been going uh, very well. We've done do, two editions of these where we take some um, very promising startup firms, mostly people with technical background, and we give them a crash course on management and kind of like the distilled critical skill sets that, that we think that they need for them to better accelerate their projects. I mean, it doesn't replace the need for them to have somebody properly trained in management, but if you're a founder or a co-founder of an entrepreneurial project, you're gonna have to deal with many managerial aspects for which you need to be better trained. So if we can take that back and basically incorporate that, that, that training, that skill set as part of the training on the PhD, and it doesn't have to be very much. I mean, we're doing something, we're talking about about 100 to 150 hours of training. I think you would put people more at ease to think about how they take their research to a commercial environment. And so if anything, my perspective is certainly that there, there would be a lot of value to bring that training, that skill set earlier into the process of the, of the PhD to the, to the extent that that's possible. And that would be, a, 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 I think, a, an important benefit to support a more a fast uh, or a more prosperous entrepreneurial economy. I'm curious that because uh, maybe in our culture or in our countries, uh, I think this is very similar between Spain and Portugal in this area, we are not connected to this kind of things. But when we talk about US, US, they know very well how to connect, you know, the knowledge that they created in the PhD with economy. Okay, so I think this is nothing, we don't need to invent anything here, okay, it's just to understand how it works and to teach the people by, by, the, by training in the, by, in the hands, you know, in the job, not only by general training, formal training, but training the people by example in the job about how to do this. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, that there, there are 
The training right now, the way it is being designed and it is being uh, planned for, for the next years, I think it has already at least it has this uh, preoccupation of bringing in these ideas of uh, giving the, the PhD student the, the capabilities to, to transfer it. But uh, as, as Elisa said, I think it's, it, it's important that it is a hands-on training and not only just acknowledging the need of that. Uh, what I think is a, a, a big challenge for all of us is for us to put in the shoes of the other. Because if you want to uh, put your research into, uh, into a product or if you want to put your research to have a, a social impact, you have to understand the context of the other. And this is something that is failing a little bit in our training. So, yeah, I think this would be the most yeah. important thing. Okay, uh, thank you. Indeed, um, um, I believe, I really believe that um, if you give uh, PhD students very early in the process some tools so that they can understand how to communicate, as you said, uh, value and understand how whatever they are developing um, can be brought into something that is useful to the society. Um, as you do your research at a certain point in time, it's in the early stages, it's probably easier you know, to direct your work uh, than if you do it in the end. And so if you understand this, uh, this language, um, it's interesting that you can uh, kind of navigate, you know, through your research into direction that, in the end, you have something that is really useful. Uh, sometimes it's difficult, of course, if you're doing, you know, some kind of um, basic research. But um, in any case, it uh, it would be uh, I, I really believe valuable. Um, so we have ten minutes about left, a little bit less. Let's uh, have questions from the audience. Yeah, please. One question here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, debate. Uh, I have a question for Marta. When you were speaking about the um, the gap that universities have between professors and uh, administrative uh, staff. Uh, I usually uh, think about that, but um, for me, doing a PhD, probably, uh, maybe it's my, my, um, my fall, I don't know, but I really don't know how can we approach the universities and say, I have other skills besides research. I, I, I can um, do other things. It, it, it's like, we have this bunch of people very, very motivated and highly um, educated. And then we are pushed to one side or the other. And because the other opp opportunities probably are not so well um, exposed. So what do you think uh, it could be done so that we and the other part can meet? Okay, so. Uh, basically, I identify two main barriers. One is that uh, for a professor or a research, a research group leader, for example, the way that you pro progress in your career does not value anything that goes uh, beyond the, the very um, central part of producing science, making uh, uh, publications and uh, eventually patenting. I, I, I know that it's different between the areas. I'm, I must speak about the medical and biological sciences because it's, it's the one I, I know best. The other thing, so this is the first barrier, and, and the other thing is that I in terms, this is uh, an institutional challenge for change, so I, I don't have a very clear uh, answer for you. I, I think that 
the, the challenge is a, a challenge of us, of we, and not a challenge of a PhD student going knocking at the door and saying, well, I want to do this and I want to do that. Uh, we have to bear in mind, we always have to, whatever we propose to any institution, it has to meet the core goals of the institution, okay? So many times I've found many people coming to me and saying, well, I really like to do science communication because I think it is important, the dialogue between the scientists and the journalists, for example. But what you should think in terms of institution is, does it make sense to your institution and how? How do you, will you, by doing, by being a very educated professional and having a lot of capabilities that are needed for your institution to have higher impact and to, to produce innovation, how can you enter the goals of the institution? It's, uh, okay. I think this is a, 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 a institutional challenge. Okay, thank you so much. We have another uh, gentleman in the back. No? Yep. <laughs> Anyone else in the queue? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Just want to go up. I might, uh, Speak louder, please. Uh, I may even uh, repeat a few things, but the fact is, I wanted to know that in your personal experience, what has been the critical role of the government to ensure that uh, good entrepreneurship and good uh, partnership between industry and academia takes place? For example, towards the end of my PhD, I realized that government does have a strong role in kind of um, incentivizing innovation in terms of uh, formulating new policies. For example, a year back in this MIT Portugal conference, uh, Professor Manuel Motha did say that uh, Portugal doesn't uh, have uh, favorable you know, bankruptcy laws which you know, make it comfortable for an entrepreneur to fail. You know? Bankruptcy laws are quite strict, while in the United States, bankruptcy laws are not so strict, so people have uh, like the courage to say, OK, fine, I'll try a new venture. If it fails, no problem. The policies can give me a chance. At the same time, government tends to give out huge grants to a lot of research activities that subsidizes development of uh, new ideas that can be easily picked up by the private sector and developed much further. So what is uh, your understanding or your viewpoint on this? Or maybe something that I've missed out or others have not really understood that you have learned in your experience? Fast replies, please. Very fast replies. <laughs> Um, fast replies are going to be hard. I mean, we could have a whole conference on that, <laughs> <laughs> on that uh, very important uh, topic. So I'll, I'll try to just give uh, two, two perspectives uh, very quickly. One is that you're definitely right that uh, public policy plays a very important role on, on, on that. Um, and the government here can take it both ways. It can do too less or too little. And so the too little is in that sense of creating uh, an environment that really supports entry and experimentation. And this has been a very important problem in Portugal for a long time, it still is in many ways, and the government could do that um, and could contribute to that by, again, making sure that some of those barriers and issues related to risk and bankruptcy are important, but also on the entry side, facilitating entry conditions like with fiscal, um, I mean, for example, in England, uh, there are at the moment, not to talk, uh, the US is different, a different reality, but even in Europe, in England, they have, for example, a set of conditions for, uh, for fiscal terms, for, for example, for seed capital and others that don't exist here in Portugal, and the government could play an important role in this. On the other hand, I think the government does too much in terms of supporting projects that have some kind of technological bent, but basically they end up being subsidizing firms that don't really have uh, an important growth strategy and an important really um, significant investment in technology and significant uh, outlook in terms of development. Because in that way, actually the government, they, they already have typically almost all, all the countries, including Portugal, have subsidies for R&D investment, which, which are important because there is, there is basically spillovers that justify that type of policy. But other than that, sometimes the government mingles too much and supports firms that really shouldn't get any, any support because they're just doing their business and th there's not really much of a reason to get extra support for that. So it can, it can really cut, cut, um, cut both ways sometimes, but certainly an important role to be, to be played. Okay, uh, 
I asked the boss, he gave me a few more minutes <laughs> for the one more question. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, nice debate and speakers. So uh, as a PhD student, I wanted to know after I finish my PhD and I want to uh, follow a path uh, uh, rather than academia, for example, if I want to go to industry, what kind of skills and ability I should uh, 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 acquire? So uh, uh, my question goes to uh, Liza. Uh, so, uh, uh, the IBM, if you want to, for example, to hire or acquire somebody, what kind of ability or skills that you look at at the CV, or do you have a different view when you interview a person or look at the CV, do you have a different view or kind of the key point that you're uh, looking for? The answer is yes. Okay. Um, what is important is... Um, there are two, in the exercise, to understand what are the skills or capabilities that you need, it's also important to understand what are the skills or capabilities. It's to put the demand and the offer, okay, and to synchronize that. So it's important to understand what are the positions that you have in your company, and in each of the positions in the different levels, what are the capabilities that each of these levels need in order to fulfill the job that you expected. Okay? And in another hand, when you have the candidate, you take a look of the capabilities of this candidate and to try to synchronize. Because even if you have the best PhD in the world, if you put this person to do a very, um, let me say, repeatable activity, this person is going to fail. Okay? And if you have a person that doesn't have the capability of the innovation and you put in the top level with a very big risk, Okay? And it's a person that is not able to suffer the fail and recover from the fail is going to be the more an unhappy person in the world. Okay? So you need to understand what are the levels. And this is also important from the point of view of the, the, the countries and what, uh, from the country point of view. Currently, the European community are finalized a very important, in my view, a very important uh, program that is calling e-skills. Okay? This is exactly this exercise. Telling to the people what are in the ICT uh, industry, what are the jobs that we expected in ICT for the future, what are the levels, okay, and what are the capabilities that are respected in these levels. So this is critical. When you start, start to take a look of the curriculums, you need to synchronize the people that you are looking with the level of the job that you, that you are going to fulfill. Okay? And to be sure that the two things. What happens is, not in all companies, there are these clear specifications about what capabilities you, you need in this level. Okay? In that level. And this is, at least in my country, this is a pending thing to do in the uh, organizations. And it looks like everyone is able to do everything. And it's not the case, okay? So I think there are an effort in the two sides, in the company size, to really to go through the description about the levels and the jobs that you have in order to be able to really to synchronize that, okay? Okay, so uh, our permissive boss is telling us that we have no more time. And so uh, I'd like to thank the speakers, again, the audience for the questions. And uh, so we now move to the next section. Thank you so much.